What's up guys? Well, today is January 12th, my 32nd birthday. And keeping up with the tradition of the past two years, I'm gonna do another video talking about my favorite something from every year of my life. And this year I decided why not do my favorite horror film from every year that I have been alive. That's from 1990 all the way through to 2021. First thing that needs to be said, some years are certainly much better for horror than others. And when I was looking through the list, I decided not to just do strictly horror films. I'm doing horror action, horror comedy, horror thriller, including horror Disney movies. <laughs> There's one on this list. That was the only movie that year I was like, yeah, that's gotta be the one. So don't try to be a gatekeeper in the comment section. If you don't think one of these movies are a horror movie, I genuinely don't care. So starting off at 1990, the year of my birth, and of course my favorite horror film that year is Child's Play 2. For those of you guys that have been following me for a long time, you know that I am a Chucky fanatic. Chucky and Freddy are my two favorite horror icons, and Child's Play 2 is in fact my favorite of the Child's Play franchise. Just gets everything right about what a Chucky movie should be. It improves and, and makes bigger and badder everything that they succeeded on in the first film namely chucky he's funnier he's more of a presence he's basically the star of the show this time around the kills are great and he's much better in this movie the third act in the toy factory i've talked about this movie ad nauseum i pretty much think it's a perfect film perfect horror movie perfect sequel and it is my favorite film of 1990. 1991 was a tough one very close race between two movies one of which is one of the most important horror films for me personally which is Child's Play 3, but I did have to pick Silence of the Lambs as my favorite horror film of 1991. Just edging out Child's Play 3. As much as I love Child's Play 3 for it being my first horror film and for what it did for me as far as birthing my horror fandom, I just couldn't put it above Silence of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs is fucking amazing. Uh, another movie that I think is basically perfect. It's one of the greatest horror films of all time. One of the few horror films that have won a lot of Oscars. I think it won Best Picture that year. Don't quote me on it. I know it won some awards. But you've got Hannibal Lecter. You've got Anthony Hopkins. You've got Jodie Foster in the role of Clarice Starling. You've got Ted Levine as Buffalo Bob, Buffalo Bill. Excuse me, Joe Dirt, you're still fucking me up with that one. But this movie about a fucked up serial killer behind the bars helping out this FBI serial killer hunter to find Buffalo Bill and, and just Buffalo Bill on his own, just skinning women and all that. It's a entirely disgusting, grotesque movie, but it is so well done to the point where there's been some pretty damn good Hannibal movies out there and none of them can come close to how amazing Silence of the Lambs is. So that comes in at top on 1991. 92 is going to be Candyman, a movie that I was introduced to way too late in life. I wish I would have grown up appreciating this movie the way that I do now. This is just a fantastic slasher movie, a fantastic horror film. Unfortunately, it gets kind of lumped into that 90s slasher category where much more than not, those were terrible films, or not nearly as iconic or as good as the 80s films that they were trying to follow. But Candyman really does stand on its own. It's a slasher, it is a horror film, but it also has so many more things going forward. It's got this gothic, mythic quality to it. It's kind of like this Victorian romance behind the scenes that's like bubbling between Candyman and Helen. You've got amazing performances here by not only Tony Todd, the iconic Tony Todd and his voice, but you've got Virginia Madsen as Helen Lyle, and she's one of my favorite final girls, if you can call her that, for this movie. I think everything about this film is damn near perfect. It's just such an underrated classic. And I'm glad that despite it not being the perfect film that I hoped that it would be, uh, the new Candyman is certainly starting to get a lot more people into Candyman and starting to make them rediscover the original film because it absolutely deserves it. 93 is going to be Hocus Pocus. Now, this is a movie that I watch every single Halloween. Ever since I've kind of gotten a little burnout on watching John Carpenter's Halloween every single year uh, amongst some other reasons I've kind of got burnout on that franchise I started to watch this every single Halloween no matter what I have to throw this on I, I just love it I love the characters here I, I love that very cool classic storyline about these kids against this evil in this town of Salem which is a character all on its own there's even a musical number here that I always love I mean this is just one of those films from my childhood that as an adult, it hasn't aged, it hasn't dipped in quality whatsoever, and I'm so excited that we're finally going to get a Hocus Pocus 2, and I hope that it breaks the mold of those long, long delayed sequels, and it's actually on par with quality with the original, and isn't something that we, we watch and go, ugh, ugh, no, 
No. 1994, In the Mouth of Madness. Always been one of my Carpenter favorites. I, I love the story of this. I love Sam Neill in the lead. I love the Lovecraftian monster side of things. It's just a very cool storyline about this guy that's trying to investigate this big horror author who's essentially like this movie's Stephen King who disappears by going to this fictional town that's in his books and hell is unleashed. It's just a great movie with some cool twists and turns, a lot of great makeup effects, and it just nails everything that I love about classic Carpenter. You know, a lot of people say that this is Carpenter's last great horror film because it really is the last one that just nails everything that we love about Carpenter films. 1995 is Tales from the Crypt presents Demon Knight. This is another film that I was introduced to way too late. I did not really grow up watching Tales from the Crypt. That might shock a lot of you since I was born in the 90s, but I just didn't. I didn't watch Tales from the Crypt, so I didn't really have any reason to watch this movie. Uh, Bordello of Blood came out. I remember that one coming out much more than I remember Demon Knight, but nonetheless, I watched this probably about four or five years ago for the first time, and I loved it. I loved the storyline. I loved all the different characters. I loved the cast. I mean, William Sadler's an awesome dude and is an awesome actor, so it's cool to see him take the lead once in a while. Billy Zane is great in the villainous role. Even Jada Pinkett Smith is really cool in this role. And her character certainly starts to lead the film towards the end, and she does a great job with that. So it's just a very fun horror film. I think that it holds up very well to where even if you're like me, you didn't grow up watching Tales from the Crypt, if you don't have that love for that original TV series, you could still watch this movie on its own merits and really enjoy it. 1996, I think you all would riot if I did not choose Scream as my favorite this year. And I've told the story a million times, I did not immediately love this film. Uh, I grew up in the time when Scream was the biggest thing ever in horror. And I was already a horror fan. I already had my slasher love. And then everybody just deciding to join my camp in my class. Like, hey, I'm a horror fan now. I'm like, mother, you watched one movie. Shut up. I love Scream now. Uh, it's a movie that I, over time I've grown a lot of appreciation for. Let go of that weird ass little stigma I had when I was a kid. But uh, the original especially is my favorite of the franchise. It's a very clever movie, a very smartly written movie. Wes Craven revitalized the horror genre for the second time with this film. And uh, I'm literally about 24 hours, 26 hours away from seeing the new Scream. So hopefully it carries on the legacy and starts a new trilogy and uh, does Wes Craven proud because this is a great original slasher from the 90s. 97 is Event Horizon. Now I'm still holding on to hope that one day we will get the unrated cut of this movie, the actual director's cut that's supposed to be way more violent, way more out there. But this is essentially like Hellraiser in space. Sam Neill, Lawrence Fishburne, they all go into this spaceship trying to retrieve the event horizon that just reappeared out of this black hole and it brought some shit back with it. So it's a very crazy movie. It's a mentally fucked up movie to where you don't quite know what's real, what's not. The imagery, even the little bit that we get in here compared to the amount of violence that was going to be on screen is pretty gnarly. And it gets genuinely creepy throughout this movie, especially in the third act when Sam Neill goes uh, a little crazy. You know, <laughs> where we're going, we don't need eyes. 98, Gotta Be Bride of Chucky. This was, for a long time, my favorite Child's Play film. Certainly was like neck and neck with Child's Play 2 a lot of the times. And there's still times where I watch it and I'm like, man, do I love this as much as Child's Play 2? Do I love it more? It's just such an awesome sequel. It gave such a breath of fresh air to this franchise with the introduction of Tiffany and Jennifer Tilly. I think that the humor here is on point. I think that it's some of the funniest, if not the funniest material in the Child's Play franchise, but it's still dark and, and twisted enough to where it doesn't lose the horror side of things, which is something that I can't quite say for all the Child's Play material that we've gotten after Bride of Chucky. Kills are great. Uh, I love the way that Ronnie Yu makes horror films. It's a shame that he only did two American horror films. I wish that he would have done more, but uh, this is absolutely a movie that will always have a special place in my heart. 1999 is Stir of Echoes. I almost put Idle Hands. That was another one that was very close, but uh, Stir of Echoes, I do think I like just a little bit more because of how underappreciated it is. This is one of the best haunted house movies, paranormal movies, before that became all the rage in the 2000s and the 2010s, Stir of Echoes nailed 
that type of film. I think that Kevin Bacon is awesome in this. I think that it's genuinely creepy, genuinely scary, unnerving. The story that it tells about him moving into this little New York neighborhood that has a lot of dark secrets and they start to come out throughout these little spiritual encounters that he has with this missing girl. It's just an awesome flick. So I don't know how well it holds up now that we've seen Paranormal Activity and Conjuring and all of that have just beaten our heads to death with what paranormal movies have to be. But if you have not seen Stir of Echoes, I would highly encourage you to go check it out and hopefully it holds up for you. 2000 is gonna be Final Destination. I remember seeing the trailer to this and just thinking that's gonna be the next horror classic. That's gonna be the next movie that starts a franchise. And it's one of those times where I genuinely was right. So even as a kid, I had some good foresight. Final Destination is a movie that just has a great concept about kind of doing a twist on the slasher genre to where death itself is the killer. And setting up all these little Rube Goldberg type death scenes was something that was so awesome and so addicting for horror fans that it spawned so many sequels and that's one of the reasons that people are still clamoring for another Final Destination, which they just announced the sixth one is coming to HBO Max. So very excited to see how that turns out. But this original film with Devin Sawa and the cast of characters and the, you know, dodging the whole plane crash just to have death come back for them one by one and introducing all these little rules. It was just such an awesome original horror film that I still love going back to. 2001, it has to be Jeepers Creepers. I know, I know, all you guys screaming at me about all the things with Victor Salva, I know. I watched this movie for years before I knew any of that and I can't just remove my love for this film. I can't. If you can, I, I understand. But 2001, this was a movie that it was Halloween. It was just after September 11th. We weren't allowed to go out and do trick-or-treating because there was the anthrax scare and all of that. And so me and the woman that my dad was dating at the time and her daughter all went to the video store and rented movies. They rented Dr. Doolittle 2 with Eddie Murphy on fucking Halloween. And I rented Jeepers Creepers, knew nothing about this movie. All I saw was the cover and that, that eye. And I was like, that one, give me that one back in the day when you used to choose movies based off how cool the cover was. And we popped this movie in after watching Dr. Doolittle 2 twice. And I was blown away at how creepy, how tense, how scary, how original, and how fucking awesome this movie was. I mean, just the creature of the creeper itself and the way that it's slowly revealed throughout the film is awesome. I think that Justin Long and Gina Phillips are amazing together. Their chemistry is genuinely some of the best brother-sister acting that I've ever seen. And just the way that the story unfolds to where it feels like just a, a slasher movie on this old country road and then it goes all the way into this classic monster film. I just love the way that this movie unfolds. The franchise has not really maintained that level of quality, that must be said, but this original film still holds up for me. 2002 is Blade 2. Now, I love the whole Blade trilogy, even Trinity. It has a lot of problems, but I still really enjoy that one for some guilty pleasure. But Blade 2 is my favorite of the Blade films. To me, this took everything that the first film did right and did it even better. The humor was better, the action was better, the special effects were better. I loved the introduction of these Reaper vampires from Guillermo del Toro, where they have like this little mouth thing that opens up. That was so unique and cool. And vampires is something that's very hard to do something unique and cool with because it's just been done to death since the shit, the, the 40s, the 50s. So I loved everything about this movie. I think it's damn near a perfect sequel. I mean, aside from just the plot convenience of getting Whistler back, which I immediately forgive because I love Chris Christopherson and especially in this role, Aside from that, this is damn near a perfect flick. 2003, this was another year that I had to sit and debate for a second because Freddy vs. Jason came out this year. And while that movie certainly has its problems, that was one of the most insane pop culture movie moments for me as a kid is when Freddy vs. Jason was finally a reality and I was obsessed with this thing for the months before it came out. And I still really enjoy it. But I went with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. And I know some of you guys don't like this. I know some of you guys compare it to the original and say, what the fuck are you talking about? This was my first Texas Chainsaw movie. And this was the first movie of this type, like that cannibalistic uh, redneck type <laughs> horror film that I ever experienced. And I'm telling you, from my own experience as a 13 year old kid going to go see this with my dad in the middle of the day on a Saturday in this tiny ass dark theater with maybe like three other people in the theater, 
This was the scariest movie experience that I have ever had in the theater. It was so intense. It was so bone chilling. It was so morbid and fucked up. And I think that this, aside from a little bit of repetitive annoyance with Jennifer, with Jessica Biel continuously going and just stopping at the next place instead of just running, you know, one of those movie plot things that we have to write in to make the movie work. Aside from that, this is one of the greatest horror films ever for me. I think that all of the villains are insanely scary. I think that despite the fact that Leatherface is, to me, the most intimidating version of that character we've ever gotten, I think Arlie Ermey is even scarier just by his dialogue and his demeanor and how morbid and crazy he is. I like all the cast of characters of all the, the kids that are whacked one by one. And it's shot beautifully. It's lit beautifully. And it's just one of those films that... Despite the fact a lot of you don't like it, despite the fact that you, it'll, it'll always be compared to the original in a negative way, I love this movie. There's no horror film out there that had the impact that this one did in the theater for me back in 2003. 2004 is the Dawn of the Dead remake. There's going to be a couple remakes on this list, so just, just bear with me, all right? Just, just prepare yourself with the flak jacket of pain for that one. Dawn of the Dead is my favorite zombie flick. The Zack Snyder version is my favorite zombie flick. Now, I'm not a big zombie fan. There's very few zombie movies that I would say are in my top 50, maybe even top 100 horror films, but this one's absolutely up there because it maintains a lot of the intensity and a lot of the dread of the best zombie flicks, but it has the intensity and the, the action-packed pace of Zack Snyder type films. This was his first big budget movie to where it really made a stamp about this is what this guy's gonna do. He's visually uh, a very creative director. He likes things to be action packed. He likes things to be bombastic. And I think that it works to do a really great modern retelling of Dawn of the Dead. Cast of characters is awesome. I love the fact that it's fast zombies. I know some of you purists love the slow, uh, you know, fearful in numbers type of zombies. I love the fast zombies. To me, those scare the shit out of me. This and like the 28 days later type zombies. So I love all of that. The gore is great. It's got a great pace to it all the way through to the end where it's really small scale, goes into this mall, you build out the characters and then eventually you get these like murder buses. This is just a kick-ass movie that I love revisiting. 2005 is The Descent. Now I had to warm up to this movie over a while, very similar to Scream. This was a movie that came out when I was in high school and I remember everybody saying this was the scariest movie of all time when it came out and they just overhyped the fuck out of it. And when I finally saw it, I really liked it but I was like, Come on, guys. I mean, I'm just the type of person that I've never really been scared by horror films. There's very, very few. I could probably count on one hand how many have genuinely got to me. And so I walked in with way too high of expectations. But over the years, when I revisit The Descent, I really appreciate how great this movie is. To the point where the monsters aren't even really the most tension-filled part of the movie. It's just the cave setting. It's, it's all that spelunking stuff that... Me, as somebody that feels claustrophobic when I watch stuff like that, that gets to me more than the monsters and the cannibals. But even when you get to that monstrous side of things, it's just carnage candy galore. The characters and the story regarding the main character and her relationship with Juno is great. And over time, it has become my favorite horror film from that year. 2006, admittedly, this was a bit of a, a light year as far as awesome horror. So I went with Underworld Evolution. Now, I'm somebody that I really do like the first two Underworld movies a lot. I actually think they're pretty underappreciated. I understand why some don't, but for me, I've always really enjoyed them, and this actually is my favorite of the Underworld franchise. The action is bigger, the lore is a little bit bigger, I think it's a little bit more fun, a little bit better paced than the first film, the payoff is better by the third act with the action sequences and the deaths of both of the villains. I just really enjoy this one. I think that Kate Beckinsale is great in this role when she's in a movie that Len Wiseman directed. When you get into the straight to, you know, video quality versions of this franchise, like uh, four and five, I, I don't quite hold true to that statement. But uh, for these first two films, and especially this one, I think that along the lines of Blade, it's a great combination of horror and badass action. 2007 is 28 weeks later. Now, I actually saw this one before I saw 28 Days Later. When 28 Days Later came out, that was another film that was just getting hyped all to hell. It looked like this weird indie artsy project that didn't really appeal to me when I was that young. I already said I wasn't really a big zombie fan, never really have been. So 
I had to go back and watch 28 Days Later after this one because I loved this one so much. And this one appealed to me because it looked a little bit more straightforward. It looked a little bit more American, a little bit more professionally shot. You know, it didn't have that grainy quality that was a stylistic choice from the first film. And so I went to go see this randomly on a summer day when I didn't have anything else to do. And uh, I think I did a double bill. It was this one and it was Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. Talk about a weird double feature. But I saw this movie and just that opening sequence grabbed me by the throat. And I was like, holy shit, this thing is intense. This is crazy. This was one of the scariest theater experiences I've ever had for certain. I love the story here. I love the way that it's expanded out into this modern city. And it's like a lockdown movie to where the government is turning on, kind of like Resident Evil style, is turning on all the survivors, trying to contain this outbreak. Even the story about how the outbreak gets out with this kind of fucked up tragedy regarding this husband that left his wife and then rediscovers his wife and then accidentally gets infected by kissing her, the survival of the kids, Jeremy Renner's great in this. I think this is a highly underappreciated sequel. I understand those that prefer the original, but damn, this is a fucking awesome sequel. Where the hell is 28 months later? 2008. Now, this is another very, very light year as far as awesome horror films go. And I had to go with The Happening. Now, for those that have not heard me talk about this movie before, I acknowledge 100% that this movie is trash. <laughs> this thing is rough. This, I understand 100% why people have at the bottom or near the bottom of their M. Night Shyamalan rankings or even in some of the worst horror films ever made. But for me, this is one of those rare, rare, rare movies that steps over the line of so bad into so bad that it's good. And I enjoy the hell out of watching this movie and laughing my ass off at how terrible it is. The line delivery, the acting, some of the situations that they get in, the whole sequence with that hot dog man, some of the deaths are trying to be disturbing and they're just so whacked out that they're just, <laughs> they're hilarious to watch. The whole third act with that crazy lady in her house this is a movie that if you watch it with the intention to laugh, get a couple of friends together, you know, have a couple of beers opened up if you need that much of a, of a liquid stimulant to enjoy this. But um, this is a movie if you watch with the intention to laugh at how terrible it is, I promise you it is so much of a better experience. 2009 is The Collector. This was one of the biggest surprises ever, especially for that year. I remember going with my cousins to the movie theater and we did a double billing of this and A Perfect Getaway with Timothy Oliphant and Mila Jovovich. And both of them were great, but The Collector was one that I saw the trailer and I went, that looks really cool and interesting. And they kept advertising it like from the writers of Saw 4, 5, and I was like, oh, from the bad Saw sequels? Like, oh shit, maybe not, I don't know. The trailer looks good and we went to go see it. And this is one of those movies that just genuinely comes out of nowhere to the point where this paired with the collection is enough for me to say that the collector is like the best modern new horror icon, even though he doesn't quite get the credit that I give him. But if we ever do get the collection and it's on par with the quality of those two movies, I think it will be solidified that he is the best new modern horror icon. I just love the tension in this film. I love the look of the collector. I love how there's saw elements, but it's so far removed from saw that it doesn't just feel like a derivative thing. I think Josh Stewart is great in the role of Arkin, this guy who is like the antithesis of the collector to where he's a bad guy in a sense in this house, stuck in the house with another bad guy and has to rise to the occasion of being a hero. It's just a fucking awesome movie. Both of them are, this and The Collection, but this is certainly the better of the two. If you have not seen The Collector, do yourself a favor. 2010 is Let Me In. This is the Matt Reeves remake of Let the Right One In, the foreign film, which I own but still have not watched, and Brian Lomax is writing me a very nasty email right now after saying that. Let Me In is a movie that I watched, and I was really blown away with how Classic and yet different the approach was to a vampire film. A lot of classic rules here. One of my favorites that hardly ever makes it into movies is having to be invited in. And that kind of is the whole theme of the, the title, Let Me In, uh, in, in a certain way. It's like a double meaning if you get to the end of the movie and see the story. But I love the relationship between Cody Smith McPhee and Chloe Grace Moretz here. I think that the gore is really nice. Aside from some CG 
you know, issues regarding Abby when she's moving around and being all feral. I think this is an awesome vampire flick. The whole story with Richard uh, Jenkins as the old man and the reveal of who he actually is was great. I mean, him getting, I'm sorry, Abby getting back at all of the bullies at the end is like one of these great triumphant moments where you find yourself cheering for the, the horrible deaths of young kids. Uh, it's just a great, it's a great vampire flick. For somebody that loves vampire movies, this one just does enough different and enough that's so classic vampire that it has always stood out as one of those little gems for me. Eleven's gonna be your next. This is a great little spin on the home invasion movies. It gives you one of the best final girls of all time. A nice little twist where you think you're walking into a certain movie and then after about 15, 20 minutes, it shows you that this is actually gonna be something totally different, which is a great surprise because oftentimes trailer will not only ruin the film, but tell you exactly what to expect. And this one really played with your expectations a lot. I, I think that the, the plot revealed throughout the movie about what's going on all the way to the third act is really cool. And Aaron is just one of the most badass chicks of all time. Like, like she, if she had a franchise, she would be mentioned alongside people like Ripley and Sarah Connor. She's such a badass. 2012 was another really big surprise. That was Cabin in the Woods. This was a movie that was just, it was weird. The, the whole story behind it. it was this movie that was shot and made and then just shelved for a long time. Presumably until Chris Hemsworth's career really started to take off with the MCU and then they just kind of quietly released it. And it was one of those movies that came out of nowhere and slowly started to get this buzz. And I remember going to see it and not really knowing what to expect. And horror comedies fail much more often than they succeed with me. But this was a movie that was just so smart and so very clever and creative with its concept that I enjoyed the hell out of it all the way to the begin beginning to end. I mean, it was so great with the humor and the comedy, but also had a lot of great elements of classic horror, cabin in the woods type horror, like Evil Dead and other slasher films like, you know, Friday the 13th even has some flavors in here. And the way that the plot elements kind of go along with these characters and the reveals of what's actually going on, getting into this batshit crazy third act where all these things are released in this hallway from these elevators. It's just a movie that just goes fucking bananas. The, from the time that it starts all the way to the end, you never really know where it's going. And uh, it's just one of the more creative horror films that I've ever seen. 2013 is Evil Dead. This is a movie that I did not like when I saw it in theaters. I, again, expectations are a bitch. This was getting reviewed and it's like, scariest movie in years, terrifying, will chill you to your bone. And that's not really the expectation you walk into. And I've never really been a big Evil Dead fan. I, I've grown appreciation for the movie certainly over the past 10 years or so especially after this remake, but as a kid, as a teenager, I never really got into them aside from Army of Darkness, which I would classify more as a comedy than a horror film. And I got into this movie and I was not scared at all the entire time. And I was like, what the fuck? And so I walked out kind of disappointed. A couple years later, revisited it, immediately fell in love with it. As soon as I walked into this with the right expectations and I saw all of the greatness, that Fede Alvarez was able to achieve with this while paying great homage to the original Evil Dead movies but taking it in his own direction. I fucking love this. This is my favorite Evil Dead film. I love the ferocity of it. The gore is on top of the world. Like it's just, it, there's literally a sequence where it's raining blood. How fucking awesome is that? This is like such a metal horror film. Uh, all, all of the really intense sequences are great. I think that the third act and the way that they kind of hint at who's gonna be the Ash character and ends up being Mia, the least suspecting character, and her being a badass and taking out that demon at the end with the chainsaw. Even the whole setup of why they are in this cabin in the woods was just so smart. So this is one of those horror films that has just gotten better and better for me every time that I revisit. 2014 is It Follows. Now this is a movie that you either love or you hate. I'm in the love category. I really appreciate what they were going for here taking that classic slasher movie approach, but putting a, a little bit of an artsy spin on it, doing some commentary on sexuality and transmitting diseases and all of that and turning that kind of into the villain of the movie. I thought it was a really creative story direction to go. The way that it's shot is really creepy. I mean, just somebody walking towards you and the camera focusing on them, not knowing if they're just if they're just walking or is that the thing that's supposed to be following me and just creates a lot of tension and anxiety. The score is awesome. I think that the movie should have concluded a little bit better and that's the reason why I still hope we're gonna get a follow-up that's going to answer some of the things that were left lingering in this movie, but as is, 
for somebody that doesn't really always line up with what artsy type horror films are going for and don't always appreciate it or enjoy it the way that a lot of others do this is one that absolutely works for me number 15 is insidious chapter 3 my favorite of the insidious movies this was lee winnell's first directorial debut as a first debut as a director and this movie i had very low expectations for because i didn't love insidious 2 anywhere near as much as i loved the first one when i saw it in theaters and I did not have any faith in Lee Winnell as a director, and that's hilarious to say now. I only saw this guy as the uh, other half of the annoying part of the first Saw movie, and uh, so I didn't really know what to expect. Walked into this, and I was like, holy shit, this guy is awesome, as awesome as a director, as awesome as a storyteller, and uh, he's gone on to do two of my favorite films of the past couple of years. So this is a movie that I think is much more intense, uh, tells a better story, and also is a lot more creative with the jump scares and with the utilization of sound design than the first couple of movies. And so all of that put together, I think this is the best of the Insidious franchise. And it was a big surprise to see in theaters. 2016 is going to be Don't Breathe, coming back to Fede Alvarez. Now, this was a movie that I walked into completely blind, no pun intended. But uh, I didn't know what it was going to be. I heard that it was looking to be awesome. I heard early reviews say that it was awesome. All I heard was the guy that made Evil Dead, and I didn't watch any trailers. I didn't watch any trailers. I knew the basic concept, but I walked in not knowing anything. And this was just a, a great movie to check out in theaters because it really has this great tension throughout it. Uh, the character of the blind man could have been a new horror icon if they didn't fuck up the way that that character was represented a bit in the second film. Uh, and I think that the cast of characters here is great, the acting quality is great, and just a lot of surprises throughout the movie to where it starts off as this simple home invasion movie, then it kind of gets turned on its head with the blind man going to take them out, and the predator becomes the prey, and then you find out that uh, the blind man might not be the best guy in the world, and it just turns the movie on its head yet again. It's an exercise in tension, and it's a damn good exercise. 2017 is The Babysitter. I almost went with Stephen King's It, but unfortunately It Chapter 2 just... Every time I think about how great the first movie is, there's always like, oh yeah, but then it leads into that one. The Babysitter to me is one of those rare horror comedies that I just love. It just works for me. Uh, I thought that the humor was absolutely sharp and witty. I thought that the concept was great. There's a lot of really uh, hilarious gore in this and just the story that it sets up with this kid and his babysitter B. And that was the first time that I was introduced to Samara Weaving who has gone on to become like a, a new horror queen since then. Uh, I just love this. I love the way that it unfolds. I love the pacing of the movie. I love the sharp wit of it and, and the relationship between the two main characters, both villain and hero and the way that they kind of get complicated throughout the movie and the way that it decides to end up, even the way that it continues on in The Babysitter 2, which I thought was damn good, is just such a great, a great movie. It's just a great time. It was such a surprise. In a, in a time where it was everybody's favorite horror film of the year, I saw this and went, that's better. <laughs> That's something that I'll go back to a lot more. I, I never would have thought I would say a Netflix McG movie is my favorite horror film of a year, but I'll be damned, it was. 2018. Sorry, Halloween fans. Summer of 84. Just like The Babysitter, this was a movie that came out of absolutely nowhere. It was a bit of an indie release and just got a little bit of buzz here and there. And I remember watching this and I watched this movie three times within like a week because I just loved it so much. That never happens to me, by the way, never. I'm, I'm very rarely will I watch it twice in a week if I love it. And something about this, in a time where Stranger Things was starting to kind of oversaturate the market to the point where everybody was trying to do the Stranger Things get up with younger kids, 80s style throwback uh, against some evil force. This kind of tapped into that, but just went in such a different direction to where I loved the cast of characters. It's kind of a spin on Disturbia and Rear Window to where these kids think that their neighbor is a serial killer who's also a cop in this town. And it's just them slowly uncovering details, trying to figure out whether or not he is or not. This is just such an enjoyable ride. But this movie goes insane in the third act. This is a movie that truly has balls. This is a movie that goes places that the vast majority of horror films are afraid to go. And I think that's what really sealed the deal for me. I was enjoying this, 
And then when certain things happened, I went, holy shit, this is unlike anything that I've ever seen. To the point where it leaves you with this emotional state that very rarely does a film achieve for me. To where I love it, but I'm so complicated on it and it just makes you think and makes you want to talk about it. And to the point where people have been asking for years now, when are we going to get a sequel? When are we going to get Summer of 85? And if you've seen the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm like, no. This is one of those movies that you need to leave it in that uncomfortable, unanswered state. Because if you answer the question that this movie leaves you with at the end, it destroys the entire impact of the first film. Uh, I, I'm going to go watch this damn thing again. I fucking love it. 2019, another humongous surprise, and that was Doctor Sleep. Uh, if it wasn't for Avengers Endgame, this would have been my favorite movie of the year. I didn't have a whole lot of faith in this. Of course, I love The Shining, but I never read Doctor Sleep. And I like Mike Flanagan, but his movies always seem to fall apart a little bit for me in the third act. Every single one of them. And so when they were announcing this, I was like, eh, I mean, a sequel to The Shining decades later, a sequel to a Kubrick film. How are you going to do that? There's no way this is going to be good. Why are you even touching this? I, I think everybody thought that. Even people that love the book. I think everybody was like, eh, I don't know. And you walk into this, and this movie had no right to be as amazing as it was. To be able to stand up against Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, one of the most celebrated horror films of all time, and hold its weight as a sequel and a follow-up to that, as well as a direct... Um, a direct sequel to the book The Shining, which is very different with the whole story with Stephen King and how he wanted things and Kubrick how he wanted things. Somehow this movie was able to appease both book fans and movie fans in a perfect way. And Ewan McGregor as Danny, the older Danny, such a great character. You've got Rose the Hat here, one of the most awesome horror villains of all time, immediately. Such a great performance, such a great character. And it's a movie that's just intense. It's intense, but it's like modern. It almost has like this superhero flair to it where you got people with good powers, people with evil powers, and they're battling it out. And eventually the third act leads you back to the Overlook Hotel, and it's just a giant nostalgia bomb. This movie is just damn near perfection, if not perfection. One of the best horror films to come out in decades. 2020 is going to be Lee Whannell's The Invisible Man. Now, this was another movie that came out and I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. By then, Lee Whannell had earned my trust because the, his previous film, Upgrade, was my favorite film that year. And so I was only really interested in this because he was directing it. The Invisible Man, you know, how are you going to do that in a modern way? And the way that they decided to do it, kind of having this predator and uh, this battered woman syndrome and all these different little themes that they're going for which was very modern and very uh, socially relevant at the time and probably still is to a certain degree that it was just such a smart modern way to kind of reinvent that storyline and tell it in a very tension filled way to where the classic invisible man you know you look back on it it's kind of silly you look at this version and it's genuinely scary it's genuinely creepy it's got some of the more shocking scenes that i've seen in a long time that whole restaurant scene jaw on the floor like nobody really saw that coming uh and i think that uh elizabeth moss is great in the lead role has a really good character arc as somebody who's scared and battered and terrified and as somebody that has to rise to the occasion and stop this evil it was an awesome movie it was one of my favorites of last year and was my favorite horror film or of 2020 not last year feels like 2020 and 2021 were just one big fat ass year wasn't it and finally we got my favorite horror film from last year which is a quiet place part two i loved the original a quiet place it was one of my favorites that year appreciated it much more watching it at home it just was a better experience was really looking forward to this sequel and the sequel might be better it's definitely on par if it's not better i think that it was a great way to expand on the storyline expand on the characters make it a little bit of a bigger movie you know, something that's on the road and not just stuck at this little farmhouse. All of the ways that it progressed the story while still leaving room to continue on the story was great. I love Killian Murphy, his addition to this and the absence of John Krasinski was a great replacement. John Krasinski as a director, I mean, this guy is just, he seriously got my attention now. I, you know, the first film could have been a fluke, could have been just one of those great lightning in the bottle things, but he proved that he actually has some serious talent as a filmmaker, and I can't wait to see what he does, not only with this franchise going forward, but outside of this franchise. 
It was just a fucking great sequel. It was one of the few sequels that I genuinely think surpassed the original. Well, that's it, guys. That is my favorite horror film from every year of my life, 1990 all the way through to last year, 2021. Now, I'm gonna edit this bitch and go try to relax for the rest of my birthday. Thank you guys for watching and continuing to support this channel. If you do want to support it, in an even bigger way, please check out my Patreon link down below. There's different tiers and different levels of uh, contribution that you can make, as well as different things that you can unlock for yourself as exclusive perks, exclusive content. So please check that out, consider doing that. That's one of the most helpful ways to keep this channel going and to help it progress. Thank you guys for watching, and as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.